Can everyone see okay? Like, you guys on that side, can you see this all right? Good enough? Okay, cool. So my name's Shay. Uh, I'm a designer, front-end developer. Uh, I'm from Chicago, where I work at a startup called Belly. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, how many people consider themselves designers? Okay, awesome. What about engineers or developers? Okay, so about half and half. That's pretty cool. Uh, so today, specifically, I'm going to talk a bit, a bit, uh, excuse me, a bit about the benefit of constraints, uh, how constraints have helped me, uh, but also how they can help you. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about problem solving, and in general, just becoming better designers, developers, and better teammates all around. And I want to start here. If you will, take, take a little journey with me. Go back to your childhood playground, OK? Maybe close your eyes and just think about what that looks like. And then strip all the rules out of that playground. What happens? For me, like dodgeball just takes over the blacktop. Right? People are jumping ropes and playing Red Rover, and they're just getting pelleted with balls left and right. I would personally cheat at freeze tag. You would tag me. I would continue to run away and laugh at you the entire time. And despite like anything we ever tried to do in that playground, it would never actually be our turn to go on the swings. It just simply wouldn't happen. And without rules, there's no telling to what type of chaos is going to break out on that playground. I don't think our industry is that much different. Design, development, it's not all that different. We can design, we can build, we can engineer anything we want. We often do. It's kind of the most beautiful part of our craft, right, is that we can go out and solve these really ambitious problems. And our possibilities are endless, and the constraints there are near invisible. But I'm not totally convinced that's a good idea. I'm not totally convinced that this free range will make our lives easier, prove to be more successful for ourselves. I'm not totally convinced. I'm just not sure. And I, I like to think that, like a playground without rules, we often have trouble without these constraints. And this is what I want to spend some time today actually diving into and taking a closer look at. Now, I grew up in Ohio. Is anyone from Ohio? Yeah. All right. What part? All right, you're better than I am. I grew up in like a cornfield. Um, so in Ohio, and I, I think it's for all of Ohio, if you're in first grade, they give you a walnut tree. And at the time, when I was in first grade, I never really understood why they gave me a walnut tree. Uh, what I did know, though, is I wanted to have the biggest, baddest walnut tree anyone had ever seen. And I was running the hallways at school, yelling at my friends that my tree was going to be bigger than theirs, and that we'd be climbing on my tree before their tree was even out of the ground. I was pretty ambitious. And I knew the basics of a tree, right? The basics being water and sun, right? The tree will grow tall and strong. Uh, but I knew I had to like, live up to the expectations I was setting with my friends. So I sought out a park ranger for advice. And I went up to him and I said, excuse me, uh, Mr. Tree Cop, first mistake, right? Park ranger does not like to be called a tree cop. We got over that. And I basically asked him, I said, hey, I have this walnut tree. I'd love it to look like some of your walnut trees. How do I make that happen? He started to walk me through how to take care of a tree. And he said, basically, what you have to do is prune that tree early and often. He's like, remove those low-hanging branches, all the dead leaves, and let the water and nutrients that go into the tree actually go to the top of it and support its growth there out. And he told me something I've never forgotten to this day. He said, Shay, don't waste resources on growth that doesn't serve a purpose. And it's always stuck with me, right? He's talking about a tree, and it sat with me this entire time. And he was right. I followed his advice. My tree did grow taller, stronger, and faster. And that idea, that constraint of fewer resources for my tree, actually made it better. Now, Microsoft had the same constraint approach back in the 90s. This is that window error. Think of Windows 3, NT, 95, 98. Say what you will, this is also the era of Internet Explorer. And at the time, one of the world's most powerful browsers to ever be seen. And Microsoft would do something pretty interesting. They would go out and hire three people for a project that they knew required five. And they didn't do this because they couldn't afford to hire those people or that they didn't have the actual office space to host them. They did it very instinctively. They wanted to create an environment that self-motivated people would love. They were looking for the type of people who were willing to trade that extra work for autonomy and ownership around what they were building. These people knew it was their job to show up in Microsoft and grow the business, not run it. Right? They weren't going to sit at their desk and punch keys. They were going to try and push Microsoft beyond its bounds. 
right? And with constraints, they forced those people to be, excuse me, to be more creative and more productive around what they were doing. Now for me, this is my worst nightmare. This is that blank canvas, that empty code base, if you will, right? Starting from scratch scares me to death, right? And there are, are no rules here, right? There are no guidance or bounds or anything. So the first thing I do is I have to layer on constraints to help me decide how to get started and to determine where I'm going to go once I actually get moving. Now at Belly, one of the very first projects I worked on was our tech block. And again, totally blue sky, go for it, do what you want, Shay. So the very first thing I did was I layered out a grid. And I was like, all right, I'm going to use a vertical and a baseline grid, just giving myself some sort of constraints here. And I started to think about well, what colors do we have? We have a primary and secondary color. We use a white, a blue every now and then. We have a green as an accent. I started to think about the actual information architecture of the site. What pages were we going to have? How were they going to link together? Right? What was the scale of this? And then I started to boil down what was our typography? What typefaces do we use? At what weights and sizes? Generally speaking, we used Open Sans. We followed the Bringhurst typographic scale. So I was giving myself some rules to actually get started and move here. And once I had a lot of this done, then I could start to embellish the rest of the site with some of the more clever details. And it's a pretty clean design with a very limited set of resources. Right? I didn't waste time on frivolous decisions that didn't actually all that much matter in the grand scheme of things. I gave myself some constraints and let a lot of those decisions expose the answers to myself. Now, Marissa Mayer said it really well. She said, constraints shape and focus problems and provide clear challenges to overcome. Adding constraints narrowed my options, all the while also opening my eye to any of the given possibilities within them. I could examine what I was doing more precisely and a lot more closely, right? I could make decisions quicker and easier, and I could focus on the important aspects of the solution I was trying to get to. I let constraints lead me to that solution. Given fewer resources, we have to make better decisions. Right? Excess resources add to the cost of completing a task. They're not all that beneficial to the actual results. I think like Notorious B.I.G. was onto something, right? He's like, mo' money, mo' problems. I tend to agree, right? With more people, potentially we have more problems, right? With more options, we certainly have more decisions to think about. And with more resources, there's a lot more stuff we have to sift through to figure out what we're going to have that's going to make the largest impact. And that's kind of the job at the end of the day, right? Is to focus on what will have the largest impact with the least amount of effort, right? How do we get from A to B? We have to use fewer resources and constraints to do that. Now, basketball started as an indoor winter sport, a sport in which they would take these peach baskets and drill them on either end of a wall. And over time, those peach baskets would get brittle and eventually fall apart. And someone came up with the idea to say, hey, let's get a metal hoop with a closed rope net. Now, this improved the baskets from falling apart, but the ball still had to be physically removed from the net. So someone had to take a broomstick and pop it out, or a ladder, or what have you, to actually physically retrieve the ball. And it took a decade, I kid you not, a decade for someone to say, hey, let's just cut a hole in the net, right? Let the ball fall through. Now, that actually like, improved the actual experience of the game, but players still moved up and down the court fairly slow. Uh, so slow, in fact, that in November of 1950, the Fort Wayne Pistons, played the Minneapolis Lakers, and the score of a 48-minute game was 19 to 18. That's not good, right? That is incredibly boring. And the sport was losing traction and slowly, slowly starting to die. Uh, in 1953, NBC was like, mm, we're not going to actually air the NBA championship. We don't think anyone's actually going to tune in to watch this. And then entered Danny Bizum. Danny was the owner of the Syracuse Nationals at the time. It's got a lot of time and energy and money wrapped up into this team and the sport and NBA. And Danny's like, this cannot fail. So Danny started to do some thinking of how he could actually improve the sport of basketball. And he knew everyone enjoyed it when teams would score. Everyone liked the idea of offense. And Danny thought, man, it'd be really cool if every team could score roughly 80 points per game. And he started to do some math. He said, OK. If a team needs to score 80 points per game, that means based off the average field goal percentage, each team needs to take roughly 60 shots a game. Now there are two teams, need to each take 60 shots, so that means there needs to be 120 shots taken in a game of basketball. Now a game is 48 minutes long. That breaks down into 2,880 seconds. Danny continued to do the math. He said, okay, 2,880 seconds divided by 120 shots means that there needs to be a shot taken every 24 seconds in a game to actually hit that average. <clears throat> so Danny put these clocks on the either end of his court, 
and he had his team scrimmage one another. And instantly the game moved faster, right? He thought he was onto something, so he invited league officials in to watch his team scrimmage one another. They all fell in love with the way the game actually moved. Now, the year after NBC decided not to air the NBA championship, the shot clock went into official rule in 1954. That year alone, teams scored 30 plus more points per game, and attendance grew by over 40%. Danny found himself in the Basketball Hall of Fame by creating regulation and constraints for the game of basketball. I think we can learn a lot from the way Danny approached this. I have an example. I was on Allstate's website the other day, renewing my car insurance. Right? And I had recently moved, so I was like, I, I should check actually what like, my quote is, and that my premium fits what I'm actually getting my coverage for. And I came across this form. It's a pretty standard form. It's got a decent tooltip. Looks nice. But as I was browsing the website, I came across this form. And I'm predominantly a designer by trade. And this just didn't sit quite well with me. And I took a hard look at it. And I was like, well, the, the font size is different. The colors, the border, things are a little slightly off. And then I noticed it. I was like, oh, they inverse the gradient on the button. That's weird. I was like, hey, I don't know. I've done worse. I thought, well, perhaps that tooltip is the same. It wasn't. I couldn't quite figure out what that was about. I said, eh, that's fine. So be it. As I continued to browse the website, I came across this form. I was like, all right, now this is that same form. This is the start a quote now form. Yet it looks completely different once again. Right? The borders, the label placement, the font size, the button, everything's kind of like off the rocker except for one thing. That one thing being that question mark for the tooltip. I was like, all right, it's got to be the same library, right? Maybe? Position's kind of random. The size is a little bit off. Wasn't quite sure what was happening here. So I decided to buy a new car instead. <laughs> Not the best logic some days. Uh, I headed over to Auto Trader and immediately was kind of looking at this and was like, this just doesn't feel quite right either. And specifically, the idea of all of the buttons on the page. I was like, some are green, some are white, some are blue, some are red. Half of those have arrows, some don't. Some of the arrows are in circles, some aren't. Couldn't quite figure it out. What it felt like, though, was that AutoTrader had different teams working on this website, and they were all iterating in slightly different directions. right? And gently, they were starting to slide off track, and things were getting a little dispersed from one another. And I was like, well, eventually, that turns into this. right? And this isn't good either. Right? This is like that point of no return. And I, I don't think you can like wholeheartedly look at this and be like, we're going to iterate our way out of this one, guys. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Uh, now, this is satire. This is obviously a little over the top. And I think it actually does its job fairly well. Um, but these problems, right? This happens with design. It happens with development. Our code bases can get corrupty over time. And the idea of consistency and standards are a bit of a problem. And I'm not here to pick on all state and auto trader and links. Like these are problems I have day in and day out. I can show you my work. Some days it's pretty scary. Uh, and I venture to guess a lot of you guys struggle with that as well. We could use a bit of help. We could use some constraints. We could use some regulation to help ourselves through this. This is often where I drop in the idea of a style guide, right? It's that constraint to provide a better user experience and a cleaner code base around what we're doing. Now, if you're not familiar, uh, style guides are a document that outline the actual style of a website. Perhaps you've heard it mentioned as like a visual library or a pattern library, very close and the same. Uh, but it helps us improve our consistency and maintainability around what we're actually designing and building. Now, one of the most popular is, and one of the first ones that actually kind of hit the scene was the GEL, the Global Experience Language built by the BBC. And it sets constraints for any property or website that they're actually going to go out and build. And it really dives in. Right? It identifies all their different visual abstractions, design patterns, development restrictions, you name it. And it lets them unify everything that they're going to do on top of this. And because they have this documented, it lets a cohesive, more enjoyable design and code base emerge out of it. Right? And it provides a better user experience for their users as they browse all of their different websites. Now, style guides are becoming quite popular too. Right? And they're used by quite a few companies. Google has one, Firefox, Starbucks, Salesforce. Yelp, we use one at Belly, right? The idea of a style guide is taking hold. I venture to guess some of you actually use one already. Now, regulation improved that experience in basketball, right? Without it, it's very unlikely that the sport was actually going to make it. Rules can improve our experiences online too. They can help us simplify and help us create some consistency. 
I think the best designs and the best code bases come from very simple and organized strategies, right? Areas where we set and follow rules and we do so consistently, right? Let's use a, a style guide or pattern library to help us do that, right? And use that stuff to help improve our actual user experiences. Does anyone know who this man is by chance? <laughs> Who's got it? MacGyver. MacGyver, yeah, this is the king of constraints right here. MacGyver's like, oh snap, that's a bomb. I have a paper clip, I'm gonna fix it. This guy takes uh, a stethoscope, a bread, uh, blood pressure cuff, and an alarm clock and makes a, a lie detector, right? I remember one episode, he takes a coffin and turns it into a jet ski. I cannot figure out where the motor comes in in this scenario, but he figures it out. Now, one episode specifically, uh, MacGyver's stuck in this enemy compound, right? And he needs to escape, but the catch is he has this injured man and an injured woman with him, right? And they are basically relying on him to get them out of this enemy compound. Now, on a normal day, that's, that's fine, but this is MacGyver's world. So the road, the only road to actually get out of this enemy compound is blocked off. So MacGyver is stuck, and he has to struggle to figure this out. I'm going to play the clip, and hopefully I can get this to work. So. The gauge of a train track in the United States matches the wheelbase of my own Jeep, give or take an inch. This Jeep looked the same as mine, and the tracks outside were a close match. None of that mattered, of course, if I couldn't get the engine running. All right, I want to take a second here. So the road's blocked. Okay, MacGyver's like, oh, that's a Jeep, and that's a railroad track. And using his logic, he knows that the wheelbase of a Jeep matches that of a railroad track. I don't think I would have gotten there myself, personally. But this is MacGyver we're talking about, and I'm like, all right, like you, that's fair. But the Jeep doesn't actually run yet. So how does he figure this one out? Let's take a look. Well, getting the engine going didn't seem to be a problem. But keeping it going just might be. Radiator's bone dry. And my guess was a few bullet holes had something to do with that. What? All right, so he can hotwire the Jeep. MacGyver, not his first time doing that. But the radiator has bullet holes in it. I don't even know where a radiator at on a car. I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. Now keep in mind, like, he has this injured man and woman with him still. And at this point in the episode, his enemies have basically triangulated and they know pretty much where he's at, right? They're closing in on him and time is actually of the essence. He has to get out of there. Does anyone know if he pulls this off? Has anyone seen this episode? No one? All right. Can you guys hear this, by the way? Is it? All right, it's working. Okay, cool. Let's see. Let's see if he can get out of here. There are times you can't do a job all by yourself. What I needed was a little help from the locals. Local chickens, that is. Egg whites are good for a lot of things. Lemon meringue pie, angel food cake, and plugging up radiators. The idea is, the boiling water in the radiator will cook the eggs and they'll temporarily clog the holes. That is, if the holes aren't too big. What is going on? All right, so despite so many constraints, MacGyver stays focused though, right? He just simply looks at one problem at a time and checks it off. Roads blocked, okay. Jeep, railroad track, think that'll work. No keys, that's fine, we can hotwire the Jeep. There are bullet holes in the radiator, all good. We can heat up some water and cook some egg whites, right? I don't get it. The man blocks out what isn't immediately important to him, right? There's an injured man, there's the woman. Yes, that is an issue, but MacGyver knows he can't actually help them unless they get out of there. Then there are his enemies closing in on him. That's an issue too, but he can't do anything about that either. He has to get out of there. 
He simply stays focused, right, and gets down to work. Now, Mythbusters tried this. This is a side story. We can talk about this later. But this is possible, actually, to actually plug up bullet holes in a radiator. Wow. So my best tool to focus is a to-do list. I know it's a bit cliche. It's easy to say, but I really do it, right? I have to track what to do and when to do it. And basically, my thought is, if I get all this written down on paper, I can create this prioritized game plan around what I need to do. And I can take all that free mental energy that used to be occupied by all the tasks I had to do and actually use that to accomplish what's on my list, right? And I can focus my attention on what I'm getting done at any given point because I'm not having to worry about what else is on the list because I know it's written down. And then I build momentum around actually crossing these tasks off. And I get in the groove and I start flowing through it. Now, I use the Pomodoro technique to do this, right? This is a technique in which I identify a task. Hopefully, it's small enough that it can be accomplished in 25 minutes, right? And I work on that task for 25 minutes, and I better have it done at the end. And then I take a five-minute break. And I work in these intervals. In every four Pomodori, so to speak, I take a longer break, right? Perhaps I go get a cup of coffee, I use a bathroom, I eat at lunch, right? I'll go for a walk, what have you. And I work in these intervals to create flow around what I'm doing. Think of it as like circuit training in a gym or something like that, but with your head in an office. Um, but you're constrained to completing a given task in a given amount of time, right? And it really helps you boost your focus and your rhythm around what you're getting done. We can improve our productivity by removing these distractions, right? Simply enough, just focusing. We can't lose sight of the purpose of the problem and who that problem is being solved for, right? And we can use these constraints to work more effectively, right? By getting down and removing those distractions. Now, constraints also have this weird unexpected perk in that they allow us to actually bond together. Now, Canadian geese migrate over 900 miles twice a year, right, up and down North America. And there's a lot of constraints involved in that forage. Um, they have weather, they have fatigue, there are hunters literally trying to shoot them out of the sky. But these birds fly together in this V formation. And as they do this, the birds in the back fly slightly above the bird in front of them. There's a handful of reasons. First reason is it allows them to reduce drag, right? So they can fly a bit further. But it also allows them to improve their visibility and they can keep track of one another and help each other out. And those birds in the back, it allows them to honk down to the birds in the front to encourage them and keep them going. And the birds rotate leaders, right? So the birds in the front, as they get tired, can slide out and fall to the back, right? And everyone takes their turn actually leading a group. And if a bird happens to get injured, two other birds will go down and stay with it so that when that bird is back to health, they can fly back up to the group, again, in that V formation. And scientists have done some pretty deep studies on the Canadian geese. Uh, and they've found out that these birds, by flying in this V formation, are able to fly uh, over 70% further than most other birds, right? These birds can fly for 16 hours straight without having to touch land. Now, fish are, are, are kind of in that same line, right? They swim in schools. They believe in this idea of safety of numbers. For them, it's easier to swim, right? That draft actually allows them to preserve their energy. They also appear larger, too, right, to discourage predators from trying to attack them. And with more eyes in the school, it's easier for them to find food and actually take down larger food items. And fish use shared leadership, right? They follow the idea of consensus decision making. That in which when a school of fish is swimming, the most experienced fish is at the front kind of leading the way. And if it actually hits something that may be an obstacle or dangerous, it just turns, right? And in the direction it turns, the most experienced fish on the other side, in the side of that direction of turn, then takes ownership and starts leading, right? And if you've ever seen a school of fish swim, it's kind of beautiful how they actually like flow through the water and jump around and share leadership, right? They're incredibly agile, they're incredibly efficient. Now geese and fish self-select their leaders. They have a common sense of direction and community around what they're doing. I think we need the same thing in some of our teams. Now, my friend Michael Norton, who also goes by Doc, introduced me to the idea of collaboration contracts. Collaboration contract is a constraint to get the right people on a team to help make a decision. And I'll walk you through a bit of what this looks like. First and foremost, you set the context of a decision that needs to be made. You don't actually make the decision. You just set out the context of, hey, this is what we need to decide. Then everyone on the team selects their desired role in helping make that decision. Those desired roles are preset, and I'll walk you through the five roles here in a second. But everyone says, this is what I want my role or my involvement in making the decision to be. And there may be conflicts in those roles. So those need to be resolved, and then the team needs to set out and actually make a committee and the decision. 
So the roles you could have in helping make a decision. So imagine we've set the context of a decision that needs to be made. Then everyone on the team has to select one of these five roles. So you can say, hey, I want the explain role where I'm going to make the decision and I will explain to the team why I made that decision. Or I'll be a consult role and saying, I'm going to make the decision, but I will ask for your, everyone's input or feedback before I do that. Now those first two roles are sole decision makers, right? Only one person's actually making that decision. The third role then is agree, and that's essentially saying, hey, I don't have to make the decision alone, but I have to be in agreement with the decision. I'll work with whoever wants to make this decision. The fourth role is advise, and that's essentially saying, hey, I actually don't need to make the decision, but I have some feedback and input I'd love to give to the team that's actually going to make the decision. And then the last role is inquire, and essentially saying, I don't actually have much to add to this conversation, so go ahead and make the decision without me, but when you make it, please let me know. Right? And conflicts can occur here, right? So someone may come in and say, all right, I'm going to consult in the sense that I'm going to make the decision, but I'll ask you guys for feedback before I do that. And someone else may be sitting there saying, I'm in an agree role, that in which I have to agree with the decision that needs to be made. Those two might not get along or understand that they need to set that context. In this scenario, we ask everyone to basically favor the lesser of the controlling roles. So then who is in consult would actually need to step down to agree. And who is in agree would actually need to step down to advise. And those two people would have to work together. Now all too often you see a lot of people bundle up in the actual agree side. And you have to ask those people to take a hard look at that and say, hey, is anyone actually willing to step down into advise or into the actual inquire? Right? Is there someone else on the team that you trust to represent your views and help make that decision? Now once all those conflicts are finished and ironed out, you establish leaders and work towards a given decision. Right? And because the team did this themselves, everyone has to honor those roles and abide by the given decision. And the idea of collaboration contracts work really well. Right? It provides a way for teams to self-select their own leaders, much like those geese and fish. Right? It also puts clarity around all of our levels of engagement in what we're doing. And it puts the responsibility of the decision-making process back into the team. The team owns the decision. Management doesn't. Right? The team had to make that decision. And they can holistically self-organize as they do that. Now, some of the best collaboration has been done within the idea of constraints. Paul McCartney and John Lennon always collaborated within constraints. Right? McCartney was really good at melody. Lennon was excellent at lyrics. McCartney's songs were generally uplifting. Lennon's always had an edge. And they were always thought of as this team that wrote songs. But it actually rarely happened that way. Right? Most commonly, these two guys would go off, write songs, and once they had the song pretty much finished or ready for feedback, then they'd come together and share what they were working on. Right? They only collaborated once they were ready for suggestions, and they always defined who was the lead songwriter and who was there to actually offer suggestions and input. The Wright brothers, not all that different. Right? They invented flight within constraints. Orville was a very mischievous guy. He dropped out of school, Yet, he was incredibly intellectual, right? And he just loved to tinker. Wilbur, on the other side, was very studious, right? Bright, really excelled at ex school. Excuse me. Uh, they always shared credit for their innovations, though, right? However, they had a very clear division of labor. Orville was innovative, so he was in charge of development and engineering, right? Predominantly most of what we do. Wilbur, on the other side, had very sharp instincts, right? So he was on the business, executive, and actual operational side of that. And when Wilbur died, Orville had to take over his brother's role and become the president of the right company. And he hated it, in fact, so much that three years after his brother passed, he sold the entire company. I was like, look, I have a very clear role. This just isn't what I want to do. And he got out of it. We need to work together by self-organizing. Right? We have to understand and recognize that none of us is as good as all of us. These teams that share a common direction and a sense of community they get where they're going much quicker, much easier, right? We have to let the most qualified group of people lead and make decisions. We have to step up when that's us, and we have to support others when it's not, right? We can use the idea of collaboration contracts to place clarity around our roles and give the team a shared responsibility. And we can let creativity come from the idea of constraints and collaboration inside of that collaboration contract. Now, I mentioned I grew up in Ohio. Uh, it's a bit different than the weather here, right? Our winters. They're horrible. It mostly rain, snow, you call it. And one winter specifically, it would rain all day, and then that rain would freeze at night. And over time, a few inches of ice started to build on top of the trees. Thank God my tree was okay. It was too small to actually be taken down by the ice. 
But a lot of trees actually started to fall because of the weight of the ice, taking down power lines, society, you name it with it. And my father was an athletic trainer. And he had some time and he's like, you know what, as these trees are falling down, I'm gonna go out there and start cutting them up. And as he was cutting one of the trees, a piece of bark flew off the blade of his chainsaw and got stuck in his retina. Not a good, good place to be. So my mother took him to the ER and they were able to get it out and things looked like they were gonna be all right. And I was a kid at the time and the most interesting part to me, sadly, was that for rehab, doctors constrained his good eye. And I was like, why would they do that, Dad? And he's like, well, the idea is that if they constrain my good eye, it forces my bad eye to work twice as hard. The doctors don't want to allow my good eye to ever have the option to overcompensate for my bad eye. It's known as constraint-induced therapy, right? The idea was to push my father out of his comfort zone, but not let his good eye overcompensate for his bad eye. I said, all right, that makes sense. Now, a few months later, when the weather subsided, I was outside playing with a few of my friends, and I ended up breaking my humerus, which is the largest bone in your arm. Uh, I did this by landing on my elbow with my arm behind my back, so it's like a spiral fracture in which the bone just sort of, I won't explain it. Um, you guys get it. But uh, so my father, the athletic trainer, I ran to, and I was holding my arm, and because I had landed on my elbow, I was like, Dad, like I, I broke my arm. And he's like, well, how do you know that? And I was like, because if I let go of it, it kind of swings like a pendulum. I don't really have control over it. And he's like, well, that sounds broke. Let me look at it. And he's kind of like poking my elbow because that's where I landed. And he's like, yeah, I think your elbow's fine. Like structurally, it feels pretty good. And I looked at him in that one good eye and the one decent-ish eye. And I was like, I don't think that constraint-induced therapy worked. And uh, the joke was on me because three months later, the doctors put me into that exact same therapy. All right, so when they took the cast off of my right arm, doctors put my left arm in a sling. And I looked at the doctor and I was like, are you seriously, you operated on that other arm. What are you doing? Like, you tell me you know this, please. And he's like, yeah, Shay, same story, right? You're going into constraint-induced therapy. We want to make sure that you use that bad arm. We want to make sure you actually take the time to tie your shoes with it and write and do all that and never have the opportunity for your left arm to overcompensate for your right arm. And I would cheat. I'd be like wiggling my arm inside the sling. And then my father would wrap my arm to my chest. So I was a kid walking around fifth grade with an arm taped to his chest. Um, but eventually it worked, right? The idea of that constraint allowed me to grow and strengthen my bad arm. And now I don't have a good or a bad arm. I'm pretty good with all of my arms. Now this is Darby. Darby's a coworker and a really good friend of mine. Uh, fortunately not injured in this presentation, so that's good for Darby. Now Darby's a back-end engineer. He's got a, a pretty opposite skill set of that of myself. And for one project, we decided to kind of swallow our fears. We were going to switch roles. We were going to take this idea of constraint-induced therapy and try it with one another, right? And we were each going to take that time to work on our weakest skill sets, right? All the while, we were going to help each other out and get through this. I constrained myself to back-end development. I know a bit of Ruby. Like, I can work my way around a code base, but I never actually modeled something out from the core. And that's what I did. I jumped in. I modeled out the database, the actual application. I wrote all the controllers, right? I developed a routing system. All things that were foreign to me before, right? I handled and learned all things back and related for a project. Darby did the opposite. Darby went out and spoke with customers. He performed research. He created wireframes, set up uh, usability tests, right? Jumped into visual design. He was handling and learning all things design. Now, Carl Smith said this really well. He said, avoid making decisions based off fear or greed focused on what feels right and it helps the people in your life. What Darby and I did was not normal, right? But we ignored our fears and we created constraints for one another. We wanted to take those constraints and allow us to focus on our weaknesses, all the while, again, helping each other out. We were trying to push each other in new directions. And because we did that, we were able to learn new skills. And the actual ability for Darby and I to communicate is so much stronger today than it ever has been, right? When I take a bit of user feedback to Darby, and he sees that the changes that are gonna echo down into the actual database, he knows the weight that those come with. And when Darby comes to me and talks about how we need to throttle some of our ABI calls and actually fix that side of it, hey, I kinda know what the words are today. I know the complexity involved in that and what it's actually gonna take to get that stuff done. And we can work really tightly around that. We have to use these constraints though to exploit our weaknesses, right? Try and take those weaknesses and turn them into our advantages. We can be more innovative if we think about how we face our fears. And it's very easy to stress on what you don't know. And I have to encourage you not to do that. Right? Challenges are really healthy. Right? You'll learn something new. You'll be more confident in your role. 
And my general thought is, so long as you're uncomfortable, it's very highly probable that you're growing in what you're doing. Now, Miles Davis wrote Kind of Blue without the use of a single chord. Right? That album is quadruple platinum. He sold over four million albums. It's incredible. The artist Pete Modron helped start modernism by giving him the self the constraint of 90 degree angles and primary colors. Right? If there was ever a runner up to King of Constraints behind MacGyver, it's Dr. Seuss. He wrote Cat in a Hat with 225 words. His publisher thought that was a joke and said, well, I bet you couldn't write a book with fewer words. He said, challenge accepted. He wrote Green Eggs and Ham with 50 words. 49 of those words are only one syllable, right? Runner up to King of Constraints. Thinking about what we do today, right? Twitter is constrained to 140 characters per tweet. That's the original size of a text message. Google has given themselves the constraint that they will only have no more than 28 words on their homepage at a given time, right? The iPhone, in its originalization, was constrained to one button. And mobile devices as a whole have constraints everywhere, right? Screen size, orientation, bandwidth, battery life, you name it. That list goes on and on and on. Now we have design and development frameworks, but I think perhaps we could use a, a framework for constraints, right? And if I could, I would propose this. I'd say let's make decisions with fewer resources, right? Let's improve our consistency with regulation. Let's focus by removing some of those distractions. Let's work together by self-organizing. And let's innovate by moving out of our comfort zone. Now, people don't like the idea of constraints, though. Right? A lot of people tell me, Shay, eh, constraints actually hinder our capabilities. They put us in a box. It's not great. I have to disagree with them. Right? I believe we have constraints for really good reasons. Right? They offer us guidance for what's relevant, what's topical. They let us know what's actually off course of what we're doing. And we cannot confuse working within constraints with making sacrifices. Now going back to where we started, right, that childhood playground, the constraints, the rules, they're there for a reason. Right? They make that playground much safer, much more enjoyable for everyone involved. I think we have to take that in. I think we have to embrace those constraints and take our turn to go on the swings. That's what I have. Thank you. I believe we have just a few minutes for questions before the break, if anyone has one. Yes? What was the time tracking app you shared? The time tracking app? The, uh, it's, it's like a Pomodoro app. I, can, I don't know the name of it. I can look it up for you. Yeah. If you just go to like the app store and search Pomodoro, you're going to see it with the tomato. Okay. Guarantee it. Yes? He did. Yeah, he escapes. So <laughs> the side story there. Uh, when I was researching this talk and thinking about it, uh, there was one episode where the writers of MacGyver suggested uh, anyone could write in their ideas around something that they believed was, was true, that could happen, and like that's an actual thing that you could do. And one of those was that you could plug bullet holes in a radiator with egg whites. Uh, so that was like an audience suggestion that the writers loved, actually tested, worked, and put into the episode, which I thought was amazing. Yeah. Any others? All right, thank you. I'm around the next few days if anyone wants to chat. Thanks. <laughs>